Okay, we are sharp in time, so we can start. Thanks, Chris. Great. Welcome back. This is lecture number six. Got two more to go. Um, this one's kind of a fun one, so I, I hope you'll enjoy it. Uh, let's just start with a brief uh, recap of what we were talking about last time, uh, so we're all uh, fresh in our minds about, about what we're doing. So I, I'd, I'd begun discussion about the conformal bootstrap last time. In particular, I'd, I'd introduced this notion of a, of a crossing symmetry or a crossing constraint. Remember, we had been talking about conformal field theories and how to define them. And I'd said, you know, give me a set of three-point function coefficients, give me a spectrum, operator spectrum, and based on the technology we've developed so far, in principle anyway, I could give you any correlation function you desire from two point all the way up to 10, 12, as many points as you want, local operators in your correlation function. I have some procedure for generating that. However, uh, beginning at the level of four point functions, we notice there should be some kind of crossing symmetry constraint on how on this procedure that, you know, depending which two points we bring close together to start with, get the same answer at the end of the day. And from our procedure, it was totally unclear whether that would happen or not. And in fact, if you give me your favorite operator spectrum and set of three-point functions, chances are it won't satisfy that constraint. And so that provides a very powerful control then over figuring out which kinds of conformal field theories are acceptable. And I'd said, I'd claimed last time that uh, I could even rule out certain choices, although to do that, I needed to make an additional assumption, um, apply an additional assumption to my, to my theory, the assumption of reflection positivity, or in a Lorentzian context, it's often called unitarity. And I claim once I apply that, I'm gonna be able to rule out whole swaths of conformal field theories. So that's where we were last time. And so my plan today is my plan today is to, to do a brief interlude about what this reflection positivity is, to show you how the constraints from reflection positivity emerge in, in our context. And then we'll return to the bootstrap. Uh, it'll be a very general high level discussion. And then we'll go to our discussion of boundaries and defects in this context. So boundary and defect bootstrap. And really, I'm just gonna talk about a boundary case because it will keep my life simple. Uh, and then finally, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the 5-4 model with a boundary and uh, data, experimental data that we can compare our results with. So that should be exciting. Okay, so it's, it's a full schedule. I hope I can get to the end of it by the hour and then I can set aside uh, the lecture tomorrow to return to a discussion of the trace anomaly. But I suspect I may have a little bit left over at the end, so we'll see. We'll see how we go. Anyone want to stop me with a question before we dive in? So, remember, because of special conformal transformations, in the context of conformal field theory, planes and spheres are kind of the same thing. And usually in reflection positivity in ordinary quantum field theory, it's a statement about you know, inserting some operator on one side of a reflection plane, inserting its image on the other, and making sure that R of O with O is greater than or equal to zero. But because I have this special conformal transformations, I can do something a little fancier in conformal field theory. I can have a sphere, I can have some operator out here and some operator in here on opposite sides of the sphere, and I can play the same game. And that's important because of this notion of radial quantization 
that I introduced last time. We can work with this coordinate tau, which is the log of the radius of that sphere. And uh, I claim that instead of reflection positivity, I have sort of a tau positivity where I reflect in the tau coordinate. And this should also be greater than or equal to zero in my conformal field theory context. So this, this T, what is this big T doing? It's not a script T, it's not a tau. It's sending tau to minus one over tau or equivalently R to one over R. Sorry, not minus one over tau, what am I saying? I'm not doing S duality, sorry. Minus tau, there we go. Just like the picture is suggesting. And in Lorentzian signature, right, this tau is kind of like IT, and then this T of O acting on some operator is really like maybe taking a Hermitian conjugate, and in that context, it becomes closer to the unitarity that you're familiar with, the notion of some positivity of an inner product, of an operator and its remission conjugate being positive. So what I'd like to do, I had all of these bounds. Um, what was it? It was something like, th these were the bounds I wanted to that delta is greater than L plus D minus two in a symmetric traceless representation, and that delta was greater than or equal to d minus one over two for fermions, and delta was greater than or equal to d minus two over two for free scalars. That's what I'd like to show you. And the way we're gonna get at that is the following. We're gonna look at, um, the following inner products. So we want to look at reflection positivity. I claim reflection positi positivity implies that if I put some primary operator sandwiched with k mu and p nu phi j, this is positive definite as some kind of matrix. And uh, the slightly more complicated thing we'll look at is with two Ks and two Ps, this is also positive definite as some kind of matrix. And from that, we'll see how, well, at least some of these bounds emerge. Some of it I'll leave as an exercise and some of it I won't do, but we'll see the general story. Right, so tau is log r. We can also write that as one half log of x squared if x is my coordinate uh, vector. And we can introduce a unit vector, n mu, which will just be the radial uh, coordinate, n mu over x. And the reason I'm doing this is I want to try and argue why this should be positive, why this should be positive. So let, let's take a look. So if I write, write out I P mu, this is just a partial derivative in my old notation with respect to a given coordinate, but in this new tau coordinate, what does it look like? It, by the chain rule, it should be d tau dx mu dd tau plus and then the angle, dn nu, dx mu, ddn nu. And I can expand that out and I'll find for the first bit, e to the minus tau, n mu, dd tau. Just taking the derivative here, I hope. And for the next bit, I'll find delta mu nu minus n mu, n nu, d, d, n nu. Taking a derivative here. 
I hope that's right, because there's a typo in my notes at the moment. We do the same thing for k. So that I think you can just see. There's nothing very hard about that computation. The next computation I think would take you a couple minutes uh, with paper and pencil, but it follows more or less directly from the definitions. So for k mu, this was a bit more complicated. Remember, this was x squared d mu minus 2x mu x dot partial acting on functions. And so now expanding that out, I'm going to find instead e to the tau minus n mu dd tau plus delta mu nu minus n mu n nu d n nu. And you notice something about these two expressions. What do you notice about their behavior with respect to tau, with the ti this time coordinate? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. You send tau, they're related by sending tau to minus tau. They're related by this reflection positivity constraint translated for spheres. And so because of that, I claim, I've proved this, that this guy is positive and this guy is positive. Okay, there's something a little funny going on with the eyes, but uh, at least the way I've written it down, it's all self-consistent. So there really is a minus sign here and there isn't in the next line. Okay. So let's look at the first one. Let's look at phi i k mu p nu phi j. I can write that out using my commutator phi i k mu p nu plus p nu k mu phi j. So why did I rewrite it this way? Do you, do you see why I, I wanted to rewrite it with the commutator? Phi exactly, phi is a primary, and so when I rewrite it this way, k acting on the primary just vanishes, so I can forget about that term, and I can just worry about the commutator, and now I can use my algebra. So this is minus two i, phi i, delta mu nu, d, minus m mu nu phi j. So this, I claim, is going to be greater than or equal to zero, right? Great. We seem to be getting somewhere. Let's, let's start with scalars, because they're easy. So for scalars, we know m mu nu acting on phi i. Well, there is no i. This should just be zero. And so what do we get here at the end of the day? We learn that two delta, I think they have like D acting on phi should give I delta and the I's combine in the right way to just give positive delta. So I get two delta phi, phi is greater than or equal to zero. And so delta is greater than or equal to zero. Great. Oh, wait a second, what about the fact that I wanted to show that it was greater than d minus two over two. What happened? Anyone know this already? I'm just curious. Hmm? Well, well, why'd I get greater than or equal to zero? I wanted d minus two over two. Do people know the answer to this? Yeah, yeah, so for those so people who have seen this before, I think you've probably seen it in the front row, right? There is a very important scalar operator that we absolutely need in the spectrum. It's the identity operator. It's a scalar operator and it has delta equals zero. And so if we'd found that to start out with, the d minus two over two, we would have been in trouble because we would have ruled out the identity operator from our, our, our 
conformal field theory, which is kind of like ruling out the vacuum. We, we don't want to do that. So how do we get this, how do we add this little wrinkle to our story? Chris? Yeah. Uh, uh, is the identity operator the only one with the scaling dimension zero, or you can imagine to have uh, more? I, I, <clears throat> as far as I, the CFTs I've looked at, that's the one. I, I think if you want like non-unitary. Yeah, yeah, in non-unitary the, the, there can be something else. But you, I you was can have yeah, operators with negative dimension, of course, and yeah, so things get more interesting. So I was wondering whether unitarity forces you to have only the identity as a way, as silent dimension zero. Yeah, I, I imagine you could maybe add it in as part of your definition of the inner product, that you want like some non-degenerate inner product so that gives you a unique notion of a vacuum state. And, but yeah, I could imagine more, more interesting behavior. Thanks. Okay, so I'll leave the next one as an exercise. It's a nice exercise. Take a look at phi k squared p squared. The strategy is roughly what we did over there. You just have to do more commutators to bring the k's to the other side. So you generate, you know, sort of a slightly more complicated expression here. This is also going to be greater than or equal to zero. And what you're going to find at the end is the following interesting constraint that delta times 2 delta plus 1 minus d is greater than or equal to 0. So by going to you know, one higher order here, you're finding delta equals 0 is OK, uh, or combined with this other constraint, you're finding that delta is greater than or equal to d minus 2 over two, which was the bound that we were after to start with. So you can get the identity, there's a gap in the spectrum, and then you have the free field and anything else that's a scalar, if you want reflection positivity. And I have another exercise for you. This one's also kind of nice. So for here, you're gonna need the representation Uh, for spinners and vectors, and I believe you're able you're able to use this relation now in this case. You don't have to go to the next order. Um, and uh, from this, you ought to be able to find for vectors that delta is greater than or equal to the bound that's saturated by conserved currents, and for spinners that it's greater than or equal to the bound that's saturated for uh, free fermions. It's a straightforward exercise. So this is in the notes, uh, this representation. Um, you can probably find it in many books as well. I don't think I presented it in the lectures, but uh, so use that and then these bounds follow. And then the last thing, I think I said it last time as well. I can say it again. There was also this business about the three-point function coefficients being greater than or equal to zero. So the idea here is I, I use reflection positivity for a string of three operators. Um, I introduce some reflection plane. I put these three operators way over here, and so their images are way, way over there. And they're so far apart that this thing ought to be equal to, by cluster decomposition, the three-point function for each of these guys individually. This has got to be greater than or equal to zero, and we know the forms of these exactly. They're just three-point functions. They're fixed by CFT, and in both cases, they're going to be C delta I over some distances, which are all, reflect, all positive because they're in opposite values, and here we'll have the same three-point function over this slightly reflected distances. 
And so the important quantity here is what's in the numerator, that squared had better be positive. And we had the exact form of these in our notes, right? So I don't, I don't need to write that down. It's a little bit painful to write it down. And I said this last time. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about unitarity. Let's return to the bootstrap, unless there, there are questions about this. Yeah. Oh, good, very good. Yeah, you could ask like, okay, I keep going. I look at k cubed, p cubed, or k to the fourth, p to the fourth. Do I find anything else? And as far as I know, no one's found anything else. Um, I don't necessarily want you to stop you from trying. Maybe you'll do something slightly different than other people have done in the past. But I think that there's probably even a way of kind of showing that um, this is it. Other questions? Right. Okay, so back to the bootstrap. So I'd introduced this crazy looking function last time, this f delta i of the two cross ratios. That was built out of these conformal blocks that we also constructed yesterday. And but let me, let me write one more thing down. So it, I guess it should be fresh in our minds. Let's see. Right. Right, the, the equation that we wanted to satisfy looks something like a sum over our spectrum with the identity operator removed, these three-point functions, and this operator, not this operator, this, this crazy-looking function, f delta i of the cross ratios. And this whole thing we said, if we're gonna satisfy crossing symmetry, it better be one. Good. So, let's introduce a linear operator Oh, I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's up to you. The idea is it's going to act linearly on the things in this equation. Um, maybe it's a derivative operator. Maybe it's an integral. Clever choice of this is what's going to allow you to actually solve the problem. Um, and we're going to introduce it such that O acting on F delta I will construct it such that this is always greater than or equal to zero but O acting on the identity operator is strictly less than zero. So say we can construct such a linear operator. I claim it, it's possible. This is how people have run the numerical bootstrap. Now there's clearly a problem, right? Because this means that the left-hand side of that crossing symmetry constraint equation would be positive where the right-hand side would be negative. And so there's a contradiction since, as we just showed, these C delta I squareds are manifestly positive by reflection positivity. And so what we do is we say, then your choice of delta I was bad. So we are able to rule out a choice of operator spectrum for the CFT if we're able to do this. Sorry. Yeah. Hmm? Just on the cross ratios, like they could have you know, a derivative of uh, the coordinates or okay. integral or, it's really up to you. I mean, typically what people do is they like, you know, pick a value of u and v to evaluate this function at. Maybe some, you know, sort of, if I, if I think about, you know, I, I had this plane the other day, right, where you have these three points I fix, this one goes off to infinity, and I have my fourth point, which I'm thinking of as controlling the cross ratio. So, you know, I evaluate this point 
at some nice point on this plane, and then I could take maybe derivatives and evaluate it at that point again. So I try to construct some operator with that kind of magic. But it's really up to you. I mean, you could, the world's your oyster. If you think you can find a better linear operator, go for it. You may be able to make serious progress in this program. But I think the kinds of things people have done is, you know, F delta I UV at your favorite point, U naught, B naught, or maybe some nth and mth order derivatives of that function, that, that kind of thing. Is combinations of that. So, if we can do it, we've ruled out a CFT and, you know, with a suitably clever choice of this kind of operator, you can rule out whole swaths, whole classes of possible conformal field theory. So, let, let's focus on an example. I think this was one of the, this is the first example that was analyzed in this modern incarnation of the bootstrap. I mean, people used crossing symmetry many, many years ago, starting with people like Polyakov in the 70s and 80s, with a lot of success, especially analyzing 2D conformal field theories. But it was then brought back uh, by Slava Richkov and his collaborators in, I guess, the 2000s, uh, using better computers and higher dimensions, and they made a lot of progress. Anyway, so suppose we have a scalar sigma with some dimension delta sigma, and we'll look at the OPE of that scalar with itself. And, well, there's an identity operator. There should probably be some kind of two-point function of that guy. And then there's going to be another term. Let's, let's, this is going to be the lowest dimension scalar. So let's imagine the first correction to this comes from some uh, additional scalar operator epsilon with some dimension delta epsilon. And then there's ellipses here indicating descendants and other operators that come in at higher powers than x. All right, so we say that epsilon of x is the leading operator, aside from the identity, in the OPE of sigma with itself. Okay? So, for example, if, you know, sigma of x was our favorite example of free, free scalar, so if, if, were true, then delta sigma would be, say, d minus 2 over 2, and epsilon would probably be some normal ordered product of the two sigmas, and so delta epsilon would be, have twice the dimension, d minus 2. But more generally, it's not obvious. It's not obvious what the dimension of delta sigma is. It's not obvious what the dimension of delta epsilon should be. And, uh, you know, one of the first modern incarnations of this bootstrap program, people generated the following exclusion plot. I think they started in four dimensions, and then it was subsequently done in two and three and uh, non-integer dimensions in addition. And so we're going to plot here the dimension of delta sigma versus the dimension of epsilon. And we'll put the unitarity bound down here, the free case down here. So that, that point certainly allowed. We're certainly allowed to have free scalars. And what you find generically is something, a plot that looks like this, where everything up here is excluded and everything down here is allowed. So in other words, the gap between delta sigma and delta epsilon is not allowed to be too big in order to be able to satisfy crossing symmetry constraints. And a further interesting feature of this plot is that sort of kink there. And you think, well, maybe there's some interesting theory that, you know, is 
that lies right there, and you're sort of draping this sheet on, on, on this landscape of allowed conformal field theories. And of course, as the sheet comes down, it's going to get kind of pinned by that theory that, that's allowed. So what is that theory? That's the icing model, or the uh, wilson fisher fixed point of this 5-4 field theory. It's this famous, uh, famous, uh, famous fixed point. And that seems to be a general feature, or at least a hope, uh, that by looking at curious like discontinuities or non-smooth points in these exclusion curves, you can identify new and interesting conformal field theories with this process. Although I think so far what people have done is uh, re-identified old familiar CFTs and then uh, be, been able to go a little further and pin down things like uh, three-point functions and uh, the anomalous dimensions very accurately using, using these, these features in the landscape. Yeah. Hmm? Roughly, I think in four it's not really there, the kink goes away, uh, but in any dimension less than four, so four minus epsilon dimensions, so for example, the two, 2D icing model sits at a kink like this, the 3D icing model sits at a kink like this, and 4D, the feature, I think, well, it should go away. So, first remark is that interesting Theories seem to lie at kinks, or at least that's the hope, or wish, or desire, or observation in certain cases. And another, uh, another remark is that you can impose crossing symmetry on families of operators. So I think to get this plot, people just look at uh, maybe the four-point function of sigma with itself, or maybe sigma with some of the epsilons, and I forget exactly how this is done. But it, you have all these operators in the CFT at your discretion, and you can impose crossing symmetry on all the different operators and try and, try and uh, get further constraints. And so people have actually cut out regions in the landscape. And instead of just getting kinks, you get islands. And for example, the 3D icing model, I think this is currently uh, one of the most accurate determinations of its anomalous dimension. So the, the dimension of these two scalars for 3D icing, as determined in this way, what do they have, six significant dig digits? One, eight, one, five, one, with some error. And then the other one is 1.41264. One, six, six again. And so this one floats up just a little bit from a half, which is the free, free case. And we'll see why it just floats up a little bit in a minute. And this one floats up quite a bit from the free limit, which would be one. And we'll see why that number is a little bit bigger in a minute, I hope, too. OK. So uh, sorry, yeah. sorry. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Uh, uh, can you elaborate what are these islands? Because I don't see how they appear in plots, uh, what they should be. I, I haven't specified them. I'm waving my hands a bit. I'm, I, the, the only okay. th I, 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 this is just a crossing symmetry constraint on, on, as far as I understand it, the sigma four-point function. But as you add in okay. more, more operators and you can make maybe slightly more sophisticated assumptions about the kinds of behavior allowed, you can have not just kinks but islands in your exclusion plots and then sort of zoom in on, zoom in on them and try and identify critical exponents okay. of, of, of these precise okay. theories. So, is this useful? It turns out it might be. So th this 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 um, this guy, right? This is the this three D icing model. You can get from the RG fixed point of this five four theory. 
So instead of just a free scalar field, I add in a G phi to the fourth coupling two in four minus epsilon dimensions. I do some kind of epsilon expansion and set epsilon equal to one at the end of the day. I know Nikolai Bobev was talking a, a bit about this last week, so I think you're somewhat familiar with this. Now there's a generalization of this. It's called the Owen model, where phi becomes a vector field. So I goes from one to n, and so there's an additional on flavor symmetry that acts on these, 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 uh, these scalar fields. And we'll try to make sure that that phi to the fourth coupling respects the on symmetry. So we have to do something like square and then square again in the way we contract the indices. Anyway, we're, we're careful about that. And it turns out or the claim is anyway, I don't understand the details of this claim. I've never studied the system um, in detail, but. The claim is that the O2 model describes the second order phase transition Uh, between ordinary and superfluid helium. And through this theory of critical exponents, we'll say a little bit more about this in the boundary case a bit later on. It's basically just dimensional analysis. It's basically what I showed you in the first lecture. Um, you can get at what this epsilon dimension is, it works out to be 1.50946 with an error of 22 in the last two digits. And then there's a theoretical uh, uh, prediction, which is from the bootstrap. There were also, I think, older epsilon expansion predictions as well, which were along the same lines as I think the bootstrap prediction, but not quite as accurate, or they didn't claim to be as accurate. I guess you have less control in this epsilon expansion, what your error is, because you're kind of analyzing some series expansion outside its uh, uh, domain of convergence. And this is kind of curious, because it seems like there's a sharp discrepancy in these two critical exponents. And as far as I know, this is unresolved, so I don't know quite what's going on here. May maybe the resolution is that this isn't quite the O2 model. I mean, it is a messy physical system. Maybe there's something else going on here and the sort of messy physics of it that we don't understand. But it is a very elaborate experiment. They have to somehow exclude the effects of gravity on your superfluid helium, so they do it in space. Okay. Anyway, I hope one of you can fix this. Tell us what's going on. Okay, that's all I wanted to say about the bootstrap without boundaries and defects. And so now I wanna move back to the, so the theme of these lectures, which are, which are defects and boundaries. Are, are there questions about this before I move on? Yeah. I, I'm assuming unitarity, so I'm assuming the three-point functions are real, the yeah. coefficients are real, and that the, yeah, the, the operator spectrum is bounded below by these limits. Without assuming um, a precise numbers of what? Of, yeah, I, haven't, I, haven't, I don't specify the three-point function coefficients, so those, those are allowed to, to fluctuate. Yeah. Okay. All I know is that they're positive, and so yeah, I wind up being able to exclude the spectrum because I would need a negative three-point function in order to satisfy crossing. Yeah, 
Yes, you can also extract information about OPE coefficients using these methods as well. You, yeah, I th you need unitarity, at least in the traditional appli application of this, this, this method, yeah. But you, yeah, you can extract further data. You can, it's not just about operator spectrums. You, you can also extract information about the OPE coefficients and so forth. I haven't used it myself, so I'm not expert in all these methods. I'm just telling you actually what I've heard from others. But Shall we keep going? Let's see, boundary bootstrap. It's a little bit hard to get your hands on this numerical bootstrap because at some level now people have developed these software packages. You, you just use them and they spit out exclusion plots. And what's going on inside is, you know, not, not so obvious. Um, so let's, let's go back to basics and try and understand how crossing symmetry works in a little bit more detail in a very simple system in the boundary bootstrap. So in the boundary bootstrap or boundary crossing constraints, you know, have some boundary, and I have these two different ways of constructing a two-point function. Because in the boundary case, two-point functions are like four-point functions. I can either bring my operators close to the boundary and sum over some boundary operators, or I can bring them close to each other and sum over some bulk, bulk data. And let's do a trivial example of a crossing symmetric theory. Start things off, and then we'll add interactions as we go, go forward. We'll, we'll return to this 5-4 model. I think I wrote this down already in one of the question sessions. So if I take, if I consider the two-point function for a free scalar, it's got a leading term, which should be familiar from quantum field theory. I'll, I'll break out the normal direction. Um, because it's important. And it's got an image charge, basically, an image piece. Uh, it's got sort of the two-point function between x1 and x2, and also x1 and the image of x2. And to start out with, that delta phi is just the free field case, d minus 2 over 2. Right, and there, there are two, two possible cases. I think we discussed this before. For, for the free scalar, you're allowed to have Neumann boundary conditions, in which case that parameter chi is one, or you're allowed to have Dirichlet, in which case the two-point function had better vanish on the surface and chi is minus one. I mean, we can do this a little bit more precisely. We should, you know, you know set, in this case, R1 to zero, which is like taking x1 to the boundary. In that case, it should vanish for Dirichlet, which mandates a minus sign. Or we can take a derivative of x1, and then there's a sign flip when you take the derivative. Um, uh, and in that case, in order for that derivative to vanish, I'm going to need um, uh, the plus one here for Neumann. Now, we said before we can write this in terms of a cross ratio, so let's do that. So we have g of c1 and r1, r2 to the delta phi. We claimed we could, we could write it this way based on conformal invariance. And I can write this in the following explicit fashion. So you're gonna to have to sit down and, 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 and spend a few minutes to see that this, this really works. But basically, uh, the first term here becomes this C1 
uh, to some power, and the second term becomes uh, 1 plus C1 to the same power. Okay? That was a little bit of work to massage this guy into that form. And now the claim is this had better be crossing symmetric. And so I'd written down these bulk and boundary blocks last time for the, for the boundary problem. We, we, we wrote them down quite explicitly in terms of hypergeometric functions. Uh, and so we do say the boundary decomposition first. Uh, we're going to find a role for the following two conformal blocks. So I have a delta phi boundary. It's going to be 2 C1. It turns out for these free field values, the hypergeometrics simplify quite substantially, and I'm just left with these kind of polynomial uh, functions in the cross ratio. So this is a boundary block where I'm exchanging some operator of dimension delta phi. So that's like the boundary limit of phi. That's the operator that's exchanged. And then there's another case where I can exchange uh, an operator with the dimension of the derivative of the boundary of phi. So the dimension goes up by one because I've taken a derivative. And in this case, uh, normalized the way I had done it last time. Maybe this isn't quite the nice normalization, but it's the one that comes out from those hypergeometrics. I get, uh, I get that same, basically the same thing, but with flip and sign. So in this case, I'm exchanging, you could think about it as phi on the boundary. And in this case, I'm exchanging the normal derivative of phi on the boundary. Okay, so that's one side of the crossing constraint, the right side. And then we have to do the bulk decomposition. one. So we can exchange the identity operator or produce the identity operator. And this has also a very nice simple form. It's just C1 raised to some funny power. And uh, so, so remember, I mean, this isn't the dimension of the identity operator. I'm getting that power because this is sensitive to the two operators I'm bringing close together as well. So those blocks depend on many things. And the other thing I can exchange or produce is phi squared when I bring phi close to, close to itself. And this also has a nice simple form that's not a complicated hypergeometric. It's 1 plus C1 to the minus delta phi. So now you, you, you sort of see how it's going to work, right? All the pieces are on the board, and the crossing symmetry constraint is what it is um, that G0 bulk plus chi G2 delta phi bulk. I mean, it had to work, right? We know free theories are consistent, but it's nice to see it all out in practice. 1 plus chi over 2. I think that's a, there's a half there. G delta phi boundary plus 1 minus chi over 2. D minus 2 over 2. I'm just including these 1 halves and D minus 2 over 2s to cancel those factors out in front. I guess that's a D minus... Which is it? Gosh, well... I guess it's not so critical. It should be d minus 2, I think, in my notes anyway. d minus 2 over 2, the 5 plus 1 boundary. Beautiful, huh? I don't know. I, I think this is quite nice. So you actually have crossing symmetry not just for Neumann or Dirichlet, but for any 
uh, possible tuning of this boundary value chi. Even though we kind of know that in the free case, this isn't going to be consistent for general values of chi because we'll lose energy and momentum into the boundary. That, that TNA component of the stress tensor is non-zero. So we won't really have conserved charges, but nevertheless, we have a consistent crossing symmetry for general chi, which more general kinds of theories will take advantage of, in fact. This is very special also. I mean, that, I mean, general, the crossing symmetry constraints in these kinds of systems, they involve infinite sums on both sides. Be summing over these infinite towers of operators on the boundary and the bulk or in the, for the four point function case as well, and these two channels, these S and T channels. But here I, I, I thought, I, I, I write this out for you because it, it is so simple and you can just see how it works in, 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 in detail. Questions about that? It, in the setting I've introduced so far, no. What, what I'm saying is that, um, I mean, that there are different ways of thinking about it. Um, I th I, so, so if you want chi not equal to plus or minus one, I, I have two, two proposals for you. One is to introduce A second, a second scalar, second bulk scalar, and then by, you know, having one scalar turn into the other when it hits the boundary, uh, that's a way, in a sense, of getting a more general chi. So that's one thing you can do. Um, and another thing you can do is you can try to couple to a CFT on the boundary. Now, if you do that naively, it's no longer going to be a CFT. That coupling will, will start to run. There'll be a beta function for it, and who knows where you'll end up. But if you can do it in a way so that you flow a little bit, end on another, CF, another, you know, another fixed point, which is still a CFT, um, there's again a kind of role for the non-zero values of chi, where you know, energy and momentum is flowing from this bulk system into the boundary. Uh, into these extra degrees of freedom that you have on the boundary. So that sort of two, two cases where there's kind of a role for chi that I know about. Yeah, chi equals zero is kind of like the trivial boundary or no boundary. Uh, although to really make sense of that, you'll need a field on the other side of the boundary. Okay, good. Any other questions? So let's add in some interactions. Let's add in some interactions. To start, let's not have a boundary or a defect. Let's just start with this system and try and get some familiarity with, with what's going on here. And then when we've developed a few results about anomalous dimensions, we can move on and add a boundary and try and improve this crossing symmetry uh, constraint to the case where there's this interaction. So I'll start with something I won't derive, which is the beta function in four minus epsilon dimensions. I think in most decent field theory courses, you're asked to work this out either in, in class or as an exercise. So maybe I can safely assume that most of you have seen it. But if not, we'll just take it for granted, right? This is the derivative of a coupling with respect to scale. And if I want to end on a CFT, I should set it to zero, uh, which means that there'll be some fixed value for the coupling, which I can think of in terms of the shift in the dimension. 
I'm only going to find a conformal field theory if I move, a sort of non-trivial interacting fixed point, if I move away from four dimensions uh, in this particular prescribed way. Okay. So the first thing I'd like to do is compute some anomalous dimensions, because uh, those have actually experimental implications. We'll, we'll be able to compare that with some experimental data a little bit later on. And uh, it's also useful input for the boundary bootstrap. So let's think about the dimension of the operator phi to the n, okay? So we know it's going to be n times d minus 2 over 2 in the free case. Uh, and if g is suitably small, there'll be a small correction, small anomalous dimension, uh, gamma phi to the n. So how am I going to do this? Let's start. I want to do this without breaking a sweat this time. This is going to be a cheap and easy way to get anomalous dimensions. So start with delta phi to the 4, which should be 2 times d minus 2 plus the anomalous dimension, gamma phi to the 4. I claim this is already on the board. It's been disguised, uh, but it's already on the board. Because the coupling, remember, the coupling and the operator, you can think of the coupling as a source for the operator, right? And we want that coupling to be marginal, which is the statement that the beta function vanishes. And the dimension of that coupling is nothing but 4 minus the dimension of phi 4. So I claim that that 4 minus delta phi 4, that is proportional to the beta function. Okay, that's, that's what we require for g to be marginal. That's not quite true. This is making a subtle assumption about delta phi squared, that this is going to be order g squared for those experts in the audience who've done these calculations. You'll know that the beta function should also include this, uh, sorry, anomalous dimension for phi. That I'm sort of tacitly assuming that's not at play. And it turns out it's not. But this seems roughly right. And so if, if d is 4 minus epsilon, and we'll be able to check this a little bit later on anyway. So if d is 4 minus epsilon, that implies that gamma phi 4 is 2 epsilon, which is indeed the right answer to order epsilon squared. I'm not going to compute any higher order. That would be too much work. And now I claim if I know that, I actually know all of these as well to order epsilon squared. Why am I saying that? Well, what diagram controls them? What diagram controls them? Well, one way of getting at that dimension is thinking about a propagator of two of those fields, phi n, phi n, which roughly speaking should be something like, if this is x and this is 0, should be something like x to the delta phi n times 2. And then if I expand this out in these anomalous dimensions, what should this be? This should be uh, delta x, the uh, free field case, n times d minus 2, plus some order um, g correction, which should, I guess, scale like a log of, log of x as well. And so that log of x, that's going to come from some, you know, divergent loop diagram, which I don't want to compute, but in effect, I've already computed it. So what does this diagram look like? So if, if I look at phi to the fourth in particular, this correction, the only correction that's order g looks like this, it has one vertex in it, one phi to the fourth vertex, and the other lines I just, I just match up. And you can kind of see how this will generalize, right? In general, if I make this phi to the n, I'm going to have a lot of lines that match up and only one vertex. And I have basically n choose two ways of, um, 
of, of, of generating the same diagram with the same roughly correction. And so I, I can see from this calculation that gamma phi of n should be proportional to some constant times n choose two. Well, gamma phi four, we just established by marginality of the coupling is two epsilon. So this implies that c times six is two epsilon, implies that c is epsilon over three, implies that gamma phi n is epsilon over six, n times n plus one plus order epsilon squared, which is the correct answer without having done any kind of loop calculation. So this is good. We seem to be making progress. I'll also say that from this point of view, remember we had this sort of tacit assumption that gamma phi was order epsilon squared, and that, that's sort of clear as well. It's now clear why gamma phi is order epsilon squared, because if I just have a single line here, I can't make this diagram, right? I don't have enough lines to join up the vertices. So this, this diagram is absent in this case. The correction is zero. And our formula, oh, sorry, tells us that should be minus one. If I plug in one, I get zero. So the next correction is order epsilon squared. Questions about that? So let's try to get epsilon, get, sorry, gamma, let's try to get gamma phi. And I'll use a trick, which I see quite a lot in the literature these days. So it's worthwhile keeping in mind, not just for what I'm doing here, but when you see it again in this, this conformal field theory literature, we'll use the equation of motion, which for this theory is g over six phi cubed, that box phi no longer vanishes, but has this phi cubed dependence. So let's start by looking at phi of x phi of zero, because from this, this, this depends on that anomalous dimension. I'll take a kappa, over x to the two delta. And then because of the way I've normalized my action up there, kappa has this uh, slightly different normalization. Uh, d minus two over the volume of s of d minus one, of a d minus one sphere. Sort of familiar maybe from an electricity and magnetism point of view. So this is our unknown, although we know it's close to one because we're close to four dimensions. And through the equations of motion, we're going to be able to get a relation between box acting on this guy and phi cubed of x with itself. That's the plan, that by using the equations of motion, we can get a relation like this that's going to fix the anomalous dimension. So let's see, on the left-hand side, this is box squared kappa over x to the d delta. And I remember yesterday I promised I would have another use for this uh, relation for the Laplacian acting on a power law. And here it is. We saw yesterday this was going to be kappa. We saw it in a totally different context, but I can use it again, 2 delta plus 2. 2 delta plus 2 minus d, 2 delta plus 4 minus d, 1 over x to the 2 delta plus 4. And there's only one small quantity here. It's that one. So if I, you know, I, I'm in, if, if this was the free field dimension, this would just vanish. But I'm, I'm not quite there, and so I have something that's small. And I'm just, I just want one factor of something that's small here, because I'm going to be relating it to uh, something else, which is going to have a couple of factors of something small. So I don't need the corrections for delta every other time it appears, and I can write this approximately as 32 kappa anomalous dimension of gamma phi over x to the sixth. Right? I'm using that gamma phi here is what? It's delta minus d minus 2 over 2. 
Okay, and everywhere else I use delta equals one because I'm going to be close to four dimensions. So almost done. So let's compare with phi cube. And we'll pretend it's a free field, because at this level it's multiplied by a factor of g squared, and so any effect to which it's not a free field will then be suppressed at higher order. So when I go ahead and I compute this three-point function, well, six-point function really, but it's normal ordered, so it's effectively just a a two-point function, phi of x with itself three times, well, there's a combinatorial factor of six from the three ways of contracting this uh, with one of those and then two ways of the following one. There are going to be three factors of this normalization and there's going to be an x to the sixth. So through the equation of motion now, there'll be another factor of six here. What do I learn? I learn that g over 6 squared, 6 kappa cubed over x to the 6th is 32 kappa gamma phi over x to the 6th through the magic of these equations in motion. And solving for gamma phi then, what is this? This is kappa squared over 32 g squared over six, and then I can plug in for my g star and relate it to epsilon, which may be a more rational way of re relating the result, and I find epsilon squared over 108. This is some small miracle, because otherwise, and I think the way this was probably done originally, you know, there's some loop diagram like this that you'll need to compute uh, to get at that anomalous dimension. But through the equations in motion, it has to be the same. I just point out, so we already had some of these numbers on the board. Like, what, what, what was it? Let me, let's just go back for a minute. So we said, let, let's just make a, a table. So I was reporting results for icing before. I said delta sigma which is really like delta phi, was 0 0.518, and then there were more digits, because that was a very accurate bootstrap determination, and delta epsilon, which is like delta phi squared, <coughs> was 1.413. And now we have some epsilon expansion results. What do we have? So in this case, we have in uh, epsilon, uh, d equals three. Well, the leading correction is one half. Uh, the epsilon order correction is zero, but now we have an epsilon squared correction, which is one over 108, which is not so bad, really, even at this leading order. But you see why, you sort of see why the, you see a couple of things, right? You see why the epsilon expansion is so good, maybe in part because, you know, they have that 108 in the denominator and the order epsilon part was missing. Uh, and so maybe it, it, it sort of gives you a rather good estimate, right, of, of, of this uh, anomalous dimension at the fixed point. In the other case, I had a one, and then did I erase it already? No, it's sitting there, right? So for phi squared, what do I have to do? I have to plug in two, so I should get a third. So here, this is a third, so that would give me four thirds, so it would be 1.33. But I, remember, I haven't, I haven't included the order epsilon squared correction here, I haven't computed it. So we'd have to work a bit harder to do that. But already at order epsilon, it's not so terrible, right? The prediction here is 1.33, and here we get 
for one. All right. Questions? We go back to the boundary. So let's do phi to the fourth with the boundary. And to start, let's focus on the Neumann case. And I've erased it already, so let me just remind you. So before we had a crossing symmetry constraint which looked like an identity operator in the bulk plus some coefficient which I'll call GC phi squared times um, the phi squared operator in the bulk was equal to some coefficient squared uh, times the boundary value of the field, I'll call that phi hat on the boundary. And then because this is Neumann, uh, that delta n phi hat uh, crossing guy would be absent. So that's what we had for crossing symmetry in, in the Neumann case. Now I claim we're going to do an order epsilon calculation or order g, it's the same thing. It's enough to add just one more object to get a crossing symmetry uh, constraint. The only thing I need to add is a bulk block for phi to the four. That's the only new object that will show up at leading order in epsilon, leading order in the coupling uh, for this theory with a boundary. And that any other operator I would add would require higher powers of G or higher powers of epsilon, and so won't show up at this leading order. And you can kind of see that, right? Like if I have, I bring those close together and I have my identity, or I bring these close together, I have a, possibly a vertex or a disconnected diagram um, for phi squared, and then for uh, phi to the fourth, I guess I have to do something like this. Where I have a possible vertex. And anything else that I want to exchange in the bulk would require more power of the coupling. But we know explicitly what all those functions are, right? We wrote them down last time. It's, it's a bit of a pain to get at them because you, you're going to wind up like expending a hypergeometric function and its indices, which I don't know if you've tried to do it, but Mathematica usually gives you the unhelpful comment that it's a derivative of the hypergeometric function and its index, which I, for one, don't really know how to evaluate, but I think the right way to do it is to go back to some differential equation representation of the hypergeometric and solve it that way, solve it perturbatively in some parameter in the differential equation. And from that, you can expand out these uh, hypergeometrics near their free field values. So it's a bit of a mess. I won't do it for you on the board. Let me just quote the result. So we're going to have the following ansatz at order epsilon for what goes into that. So we're going to have a delta phi, which is its free field value, plus a small correction. We'll have a delta phi squared, which is its free field value, plus a small correction. We'll possibly have a delta phi to the fourth. Actually, this doesn't uh, appear so we don't really need it. We just need the leading order bit. That, that correction is not going to show up. 
And then finally for delta phi hat, we need the leading order bit. It's just the boundary dimension of the field plus a possibly different correction. And, and notice already something interesting is happening. I'm allowing for the bulk field to have a different scaling dimension than its boundary value. That's something rather special about these systems. You might have thought that this should be this, but it's not. And then also the coefficients. So we had the leading order bits that we computed last time, or not last time, but in, in the absence of interaction. So we just want this, all this to leading order in epsilon, so GC phi to the four. This will just have an epsilon bit. It wasn't present originally. And then mu squared, I seem to remember I wrote a one half because of some funny normalization of the blocks plus some correction. Okay, so we plug that in here with our extra block. We expand everything out, the leading order, everything should be fine. We already checked that. And then we try to match the uh, result at leading order in epsilon, the, the next order in epsilon, and see what we get. So an analytic bootstrap. And again, it's very special we can do this here, that we have this finite number of blocks that we're just playing with. I mean, usually you've got infinite numbers of blocks on both sides and you need some more clever scheme to organize all those, all those coefficients. So we expand and match powers, which I'm not gonna do, although I've given you some sense of what's going on. And we find that gamma phi is order epsilon squared, which is great, because we, we established just a few minutes ago that the order epsilon correction to this guy should be absent. So that's a, that's a consistency check on this, on this method. So we allowed for it to be there in our ansatz. We allowed for some order epsilon part, but lo and behold, it's not there. It's what we just found. We can look at gamma phi squared we find some undetermined parameter alpha times epsilon plus order epsilon squared. We're just solving to linear order in G or epsilon. We find gamma phi hat, and lo and behold, it's different. It's different from the bulk value. It has a different scaling dimension. And then there's other stuff that comes in. So there's delta that are less interesting for us, these uh, three-point function coefficients um, well, I, I mean, I guess they're interesting, but well, for the measurements I'm going to quote in a minute, they're not useful. And that, in fact, doesn't shift at all at this order. And again, this is, this is all to leading order. There can be higher order corrections. Hmm plus dot, dot, dot. I guess this is now order epsilon the way I've defined it, but it's, it's not there at this order. So actually we've identified a whole family of crossing symmetry constraint uh, possibilities, which is interesting. Uh, and, and we can't completely fix everything yet. We need some external input. So the proposal is to use what we computed a few minutes ago as input, this, the, the bulk value of phi squared. It shouldn't be, you know, if you go far enough away from the boundary, these anomalous dimensions shouldn't be affected by the boundary behavior. They should be what they are in the absence of a boundary. So we should be able to use that as input data in our analytic bootstrap here. So we'll use that. What was it? This, this number here. I'll erase this. We can use gamma phi squared is epsilon over three plus order epsilon squared to fix alpha. And then we learn all of these other anomalous dimensions. And we did all this in the Neumann case. We could repeat 
I'll, I'll leave that as an exercise. Well, I guess already this was an exercise since I didn't really fill in the details. We could repeat this whole business for Dirichlet. And there's a slightly different story. We have to make a swap, right? The boundary block now doesn't depend on, we've got to remove that one and replace it with the other guy, the normal derivative operator. And uh, I'll just claim we find the same anomalous dimensions. The, the three-point function coefficients shift around a little bit, but the, the anomalous dimensions actually stay the same in the Dirichlet case. So that's another small exercise one could do. And then the last thing I'll, I'll note this was all done in the case of um, the icing type model, the, the original 5 4 scalar field theory. We can again broaden our class of models. Uh, I won't work this out. I've worked out enough, I think. Uh, we can go from icing back to the ON. And the same crossing symmetry uh, problem applies in that case as well. And so, in fact, we get a whole host of uh, boundary critical exponents if we put, it, put in the bulk, bulk ones. So if I just quote a result here for gamma phi squared in the ON model, it's this n plus 2 over n plus 8, epsilon plus order epsilon squared. These things, I think, are known now to like order epsilon to the fifth, but we're just working leading order here. So I can get, you know, using this input data for icing or for ON, I can get all of these other critical exponents um, and three-point function coefficients that I have, have here. Great. Questions about this? So, so we're ready for a big payoff now. Although I know, I mean, I, I'm talking to the wrong audience, right? I, you guys are here to quantize gravity and uh, <laughs> unify, unify the standard model and figure out the black hole information paradox. But, but we can still do something useful. So let's bring this whole thing full circle. Say for the minute, we're all fascinated by the subject of surface magnetization. Just like in lecture one, we were all anxious to know what the speed of a capillary wave on a pond was. I know nothing about surface magnetization. However, in the context that we're working in, I have some vague idea that the magnet surface magnetization, and let me, let me further specify, for, for reasons that will become clear a little later, let, let's specify that we're working in the Dirichlet boundary case. Okay. So the thing that will order on the boundary is the normal derivative of phi. That's the guy that's kind of present, at least perturbatively. So I have some rough idea in my head that I should then measure magnetization uh, in units of delta n phi hat. And what I'm after here is I'm after how this behaves as, a different, as I approach the critical temperature. So there's going to be some exponent, surface exponent, so I'll give it a hat. As I approach the critical temperature, how the surface magnetization behaves how it scales, okay? So the other thing I need to know is what this temperature is in my model. And the way people usually think about this, they think about Tc minus T as being a source 
for phi squared. So I have a relevant operator in my system. As I tune it, I go past the critical point. You know, I get this uh, point where I get the, the spontaneous symmetry breaking in this uh, icing model or open model. So as I tune the temperature, I should be able, the idea is I should be able to, you know, tune past this critical point, past the, past the critical point. And so because of that, I have in my head then that the scaling dimension of that temperature difference should go it should be the source for phi squared, so it should go as d minus delta phi squared. And therefore, by dimensional analysis, uh, beta hat should be delta dn phi hat over d minus delta phi squared. I have to tell you, that was hard fought. <laughs> I was struggling with the condensed matter literature last night for several hours to get there. But really, it really is just that capillary wave argument in another guise. Uh, the way they dress it up in all of these Greek letter critical exponents, but at the end of the day, it boils down to a very simple dimensional argument. Okay, well, I guess we can leave that up. Let's take this out. Because we, we know all of those now, right? From our, we know delta phi squared from at least to order epsilon from what we were doing before. We know, um, we know delta n phi hat from this boundary bootstrap. Um, and if we were to work a little harder, I claim we could even go to higher order in, in how we know these, 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 uh, these quantities. So let, let me just quote the results. So delta phi squared, it's the free field result plus the result I just quoted, uh, but derived in the case n equals one, plus a new contribution that I'm just copying from uh, papers in the literature that have been around since the early 80s. Okay. And then we can look at delta n phi hat. And uh, again, this was known, I think, since the early 80s by uh, epsilon expansion, although there's a nice analytic bootstrap approach, which got the same answer recently by Agnese BC, one of our organizers, I believe, right? So Agnese BC has computed this using a boundary bootstrap. And it agreed with what people had before. So that was great. Okay, so we plug that in. Uh, we compute beta hat in d equals three with a 2D boundary. And that's what we wanna do for these statistical systems. Uh, it's you know, a 3D, 3D spatial metal with some 2D spatial boundary. And we'll boldly set epsilon equal to one even though it's not really justified. And we can make a little table here of, um, let's see, n versus beta hat in zero, which sometimes people say is relevant for polymer physics, two, or one, two, and three. And we can get these different numbers, 0 0.78. It's all roughly four-fifths, 0 0.79, 0 0.81, and 0 0.82. Although probably at this point, maybe there's, there's some versions of the numerical bootstrap which may be able to get you even more accurate versions of these numbers. But we're, we're happy with this, right? We're happy with the uh, order epsilon squared result. And miracle of miracles, at least for me, who, there's experiment here. Um, that we can compare with. Uh, there's a version of the O3 model that's been measured, it's nickel. So you cleave a nickel surface, you bring it past some magnetic uh, ordering, ferromagnetic ordering phase transition, 
Uh, you shoot, I think, electrons at some grazing incidence, low energy grazing incidence at the, at the surface, and you try and figure out from how the electrons scatter what the magnetization is, and you get an exponent as you tune past the critical temperature. Which is in surprisingly good agreement with what we computed up there. There's a model of the O2 system. It's an iron aluminum alloy. You do the same kind of trick, although here I think the measurement was with x-rays. Here the agreement isn't so great, but I don't know. You squint at it, it's roughly four-fifths. And then there's, in fact, a couple of measurements with icing. There's some binary liquid. I don't know how that measurement was done. And then there's some kind of molecular solid. I, again, don't know how these measurements were done. Uh, these aren't great, but the errors are rather large, and so... Not bad, and, and hope maybe for the future, if one could get experimentalists interested in these kinds of systems again. I think the last measurement here was done in like 1993 that I'm, I'm aware of. But maybe there's more recent experimental stuff. If people know, please tell me. So that's great. I've got a little bit more I want to tell you. So I, I left a loose end here. I left a loose end, which was... Um, the notion of what kind of boundary condition I wanted to choose, which I want to tie up in our last 10 minutes or so. Are there, are there questions so far? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So you, you uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know the details of this argument, but I have seen it claimed that uh, the ON model of N equals zero has something to do with polymer physics. I, you know, you, you, can, you can solve for any n, and you analytically continue an n, and, but I, I don't know the details. In this case, I suppose it, I mean, it has something to do with you know, the degrees of freedom of the spin, like how, how, how the spin exactly is ordering in, this, in these magnetic transitions. But, yeah. Okay, so spend a little bit of time on boundary conditions if there are no other questions. Now, why didn't I ask about Neumann boundary conditions? What, what, it, what, what kind of boundary conditions do you get in these systems most naturally? So there's another relevant operator in this ON model, once I have a boundary that I haven't, haven't mentioned yet. And from a classical point of view, I could write it like this. Sort of a boundary mass term. And on the bulk, that bulk mass term I was thinking of as somehow temperature. And here's another one that I have at my disposal to play with. So let's do a little bit of a classical analysis here to try and figure out how this boundary term affects the physics. So if I, you know, I run a variational principle on my action, when I integrate by parts, I'll usually get some kind of boundary term for the scalar field. And now to that, I add this, and I'm gonna find naturally a sort of modified boundary condition if I let the variation of my field be free. If I don't fix the val value of the field myself, if I let it fluctuate, uh, I'll get a boundary condition which is established by this, this new relevant piece I add on the boundary. And, right, so there are basically three distinct things that happen. If the mass of the boundary is greater than zero, then Remember, we're, we care about dimensionless ratios here, we're ask, and we're asking about low energy physics, so we've got to form some ratio of the mass to the energy that's dimensionless, and this will go to infinity at low energy, which suggests, in this case, if I add a positive mass, that what I need to do to satisfy the boundary condition 
is set phi to zero with some small correction. So this is Dirichlet. I could, of course, tune this system, just like I often tune the, the bulk mass to a critical point, I can tune the boundary mass to a critical point. And uh, classically, I mean, quantum mechanically, there are corrections to this, but uh, we won't get bogged down with that. We have a, naively anyway, a, a sort of a, a critical point here where, the, where we get Neumann by, by carefully tuning this mass term away. And then finally, there's another case where the mass of the boundary is negative in which case I'm allowed to have a, a scaling behavior for the field. This is new. So the field you can think of as like spontaneously breaks my Owen symmetry. It generates some, some surface order. Um, and people often call this extraordinary. And because of the subtleties of the renormalization group, I guess people often replace the language here. They call this special and they call this ordinary because maybe there's small corrections to what the field is actually doing at the boundary that come from RG effects. Anyway, we have, we have kind of a phase diagram now we can draw. kind of flesh this picture out. So let's write minus M, just because of the way that the picture is in my head. I have the M bulk, which I can think of as being proportional to T minus TC. So there'll be some critical mass uh, below which I have uh, ordering, uh, and above which uh, the system is disordered. So by this I mean that you know, phi i is zero or phi i is not zero. But now as I tune through m, um, let's see, so for positive m, I'll have my ordinary phase transition. Uh, for negative m, I'll have my extraordinary And then somewhere in between, I'll have this special point. So there's a sense in which this ordinary guy is kind of the generic situation. And there are various issues with getting into this region. So it's sort of, I think, harder to find experimental systems. So, so this is disordered. And here, you know, it's surface ordered. Uh, but still bulk disordered. And yeah, I mean, this line is kind of a question mark too, right? Because you remember we're in three dimensions and so the boundary is two dimensional. And I'll, I'll bring in Coleman's name again. Uh, there's this coleman merman wagner theorem, which says that I'm only allowed to have phase transitions uh, for continuous symmetries in more than two dimensions. So if I was, for example, studying the ON model for N greater than two, this would have to be some kind of crossover at best. But if it's icing, it could still be a phase transition. Um, and so it gets a little bit murky here and, and people are still writing papers about issues connected with this phase diagram. There's a nice recent work by Max Metlitsky, for instance, and collaborators where he examines exactly what happens uh, for n greater than two in precisely three dimensions, how, how this phase diagram should be adjusted. I think that's all I wanted to say. I mean, I, but, but the point again here is that you know, this is the, 
the ordinary or Dirichlet condition that's kind of the typical situation experimentally, at least as far as I gather. Great. Thanks very much. So I'll be back tomorrow and we'll, we'll continue with sort of an orthogonal line of development of these boundary and defect CFTs. We'll talk about uh, the trace anomaly. <laughs>